Good afternoon. Let's look today at the commissioning of the new Bible translation by the Senate of Dort. This is the Staten Bible. That's what it's called, the Staten Bible, the Dort commissioned, state authorized translation. Two parts there. Dort commissioned it as a Senate, and the state, the government called the States General, authorized the translation of the Bible in Dutch. That's our topic this afternoon. There were Dutch translations prior to the Senate of Dort. Uh, the the Liesvelt Bible, named simply after the publisher, was the first. It came out in 1526. It is a literal translation of Luther's translation into the German. So from the German into the Dutch, probably a fairly easy thing to do because the languages are quite similar. In 1542, the publisher added some notes to the Bible and published it, and they were very obviously notes that were in harmony with the Reformation, and it led to his being put to death by the Spanish authorities. It was a beloved Bible, and it served the people well. The last edition was still published as late as 1608, so they continued to use it for many years. But it was a weakness. It had a weakness in that it was, it was a translation of a translation. So if you're looking for something that's close to the original languages, this has departed a couple steps away from it. And the people felt, the theologians, Bibles, uh, ministers especially felt, we need something closer to the original languages. A second translation appeared in 1562, popularly known as the Duke's Ice. If that sounds a little bit like a deuce and an ace, well, that's exactly what it means. And it comes from a footnote, an obscure footnote, and just became kind of a popular name, deuce ace. Others were not as satisfactory as well. So they, we come to the Senate of Dort, and there's a, a clear need for a good translation. And this is the first thing, really, of any importance that the Senate took up in its work, a Bible translation. President Johannes Bogerman raised the issue early on. He said, look, other people are doing this. He pointed to the King James, 1611, and a good Italian, ver Italian version that had come out. And he said, we need to do this also. We need to have a translation that's faithful to the original and something our people can use. So he raised it. And in the eighth session, after much discussion, the Dutch delegates voted to proceed with the production of a new translation of the Bible. They didn't simply say, let's translate it. They said, we want a particular kind of translation. We want to be sure that it's faithful to the scriptures, to the original works. So they adopted some principles. The new translation would be directly from the original languages, Hebrew and Greek. It would not be a revision merely of existing translations, although they were wise men and they said, look, some of the existing translations would still have good terminology and phrases, so don't be afraid to use them if they are well done. Be as literal as possible was a, a principle adopted. If words are to be added, then they are, in order to complete the meaning in the Dutch, then those words would be put in italics and in a different type font very much as we have in the King James with the italics. In addition, they decided to use the Dutch do when translating the second person singular pronoun referring to God, so it would be a less formal Dutch pronoun, to translate the word Jehovah as Hera, Lord, in capital letters, as is done in the King James Version as well. One of the debates was, do we include the apocryphal books? Ordinarily, the apocryphal books would be inserted between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This has been done all through the Middle Ages in the Latin version that the Bible had, and the Roman Catholic Bibles all contained it because it is a set of books from which they could draw some of their heretical teachings and that was a problem then for some of the men who were at the Senate of Dort. Should we include it? Well, men like Gomaris and Diodati said, absolutely not. This is a, these are books of myths, and from them you will take many doctrinal errors, so do not include the apocryphal books in the Scripture. But the Senate said, yes, we're still going to include them. It's been done for centuries. We will include them, but We'll put them at the end of the Bible, a different pagination even, and typesetting, 
And we'll have an introduction, a preface that will call attention to the fact that there are errors in these books that we have to be careful not to bring into our theology. So the translation was organized. These are the men on the right-hand side who were appointed. They appointed six translators with alternates. And over here on the side, these are the two men that did actually become alternates as some of them died before it was finished. They decided, the Senate did, that it would be done in Leiden, Leiden, and the revisers would be two men from every one of the provincial synods. So these are the six translators, but there would be many other men who would go over the translation to improve it and make it the best that it could be. They hoped that it would be finished in four years. However, it had to go to the government for funding, and the states general was at war. Now in, in 1621, the war resumed with Spain. The truce was over. This was a low priority item. They didn't have much money for this kind of thing, so nothing happened for a good time. In 1624, they finally agreed to give support. It took another year before they agreed that it should be done in the city of Leiden, as Dort had decided. Two of the translators had already died and had to be replaced, which they were. The progress in the Old Testament, the first meeting of the Old Testament men was 1626 in Johannes Bogerman's home in Leiden. The Pentateuch was ready in 1628, the entire Old Testament manuscript in 1632, and then followed years of proofing and revision. And the revisers were not men who just would fall over to the translators. They argued and they debated, and, and it was quite a process to get the final product to the printer. The New Testament was finished in 1634, and again, revisions followed. The first copy of the Bible was printed in 1637. The approval and support of the States General means that it is called the Staten Bible, the States Bible, or another term, the Staten Vertaling, the state's translation. Those are the two terms used to describe this Bible, the Staten Bible and the Staten Vertaling. The 16734 edition of the Staten Bible with annotations from Reformed ministers. Ministers went through this and added notes. Some of them are merely about the language issue of Hebrew or Greek term, but most of them are commentary, brief commentary on the whole of the Scripture written by Reformed men, many of them who had lived through Dort, many of them who were delegates to the Senate of Dort. This is a gold mine of theological interpretation of Scripture. We have in our possession a copy of the 1637 edition of the Staten Bible. Inside you have an official signature with the date given there that it was sold. This is found in the, uh, it's found in the back, so you can check out some of the artifacts back there that Mr. Terpster has brought together, and this is one of them. It was given to us by the Feenstra family out of Redlands several years ago. We had it rebound because the back of it, not this part that you can see, but the back of it was falling apart and it was rebound very well by a local bookbinder. That book is also found in English in the Hock Bible. A man by the name of Theodore Hock, a German, translated it into the English and published it in England some years later in 1657. That Bible is also available and I forgot to take my copy along, but I'll try to remember to do that. So you can page through this and see. It's a facsimile, not the easiest thing to read, but it is available, and you can read all the English comments translated from the Dutch. The significance of the Staten Bible. First of all, I'm going to point out that it's a Bible for the Dutch. Secondly, the authority of the Bible. And thirdly, what changes came after this Bible was translated. First of all, this was a Bible for the Netherlands. It really helped standardize the Dutch language. Remember, these are all different provinces that are coming together as a nation, and now we have a Bible that will somewhat standardize the language of the people as German did, Luther's German Bible did for Germany. For at least 200 years, this was the single most owned book in the Netherlands. 
the book that people took out and read at the table, as well as read it in church. Dort's view of the Bible's authority is, is important here. The Bible is the infallibly inspired Word of God. That's how Dort viewed it. God speaks through the Scriptures. The believer knows God from His authoritative Word. This is the standard for doctrine and walk. And recall that when the, when the Senate set forth the canons, the Scriptures, they quoted the Scriptures. That was the end of the story. If the Scripture said it, that's what we must maintain. This is the authority of the Word of God. The Dort's view of Bible interpretation, the literal meaning is the correct meaning. The Old and New Testaments were two Testaments in full agreement. They are equally important, and they can be used to interpret each other. Now, this is all basic knowledge for us, but I'm, I'm just setting this before you. This is what Dort maintained. This is what the translators maintained. This is what the, the commentators of the Scripture maintained. This was their view of Scripture. So the annotations come, bring that forth. They were devoted to the Holy Scriptures, and that's what makes it such a fine commentary. That's the reform view of Scripture and its interpretation. But this is about to change. Middle of the 1600s, right about then, things begin to change as far as the church's view of Scripture. Such a man as Hugo de Groot, who was an Arminian, expelled from the Netherlands because of his Arminianism, he wrote a book in 1644 called The Annotation on the Old Testament, and in it, he tried to keep out anything from the New Testament. Those are two different documents. He tried to keep out anything of Reformed theology in the Old Testament. It was a history book, and the man was front and center in the Old Testament. Not God speaking, but a history of man. Arminianism has that in its very core. Arminianism gives man a place in his salvation, and therefore when it picks up the Holy Scriptures, it is prone to give man a part in Scripture's inspiration. How did the Bible come to be? Men wrote and men gave their opinions, and that's how these men were beginning to view the Bible. Higher criticism of the Bible was introduced somewhat by Baruch Spinoza, a, a Jewish man who's of the Netherlands, Jewish by descent. He took the scientific method and applied it to Scripture and as he said, then, therefore, we cannot assume that every passage is true. We have to demonstrate it before we can believe that what the Scripture says is true. That's the attitude that began to sweep into the churches through this period after the mid-1600s. The Stoughton Bible is something God providentially gave the Reformed churches in the Netherlands this faithful translation and sound commentary before all these wrong views of Scripture began to infiltrate the church of Jesus Christ. Don't you see a parallel there too with the King James 1611? God gave the English world a faithful translation before all these modern ideas, wrong ideas of Scripture began to infiltrate the church. The Stoughton Bible then, translated by men highly qualified in the language, knowledgeable in the antiquity so they could give a good, accurate translation, providing the backbone of the Reformed churches in the Netherlands for centuries, with the annotations that embodied the Reformed, the Calvinistic theology. One of the beautiful products as a result of the Senate of Dort.